I listen to Gregorian chant. Oh, good. I do, too. Which is another one of my numinous experiences. Oh, I'd love to hear that. Well, when I was 11 years old, I was at a movie, and I don't know who the characters were, but it was a period piece. So the, the two characters were riding on horseback past a cathedral, and you could hear G Gregorian chant being sung in the cathedral as they're going by. I don't remember anything else about the movie. I don't know who was in it, what it was about, or anything <laughs> else, but I do remember the chant. I've loved it ever since. Wow, since 11. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Since we decided to do this in two segments today. Yeah. So I, I think we'll get through image 19 today. Okay. Just to say that this section is midlife 30 through 55. So we're going to cover about 25 years. And it's a, it's a cycle of dying and rising. It's a cycle of, you know, Jung would have the four stages of conflict. Lament, uh, let's see, conflict. How does it go? Lament. Con contra contest, defeat. Contest, defeat. Lamentation. Lamentation and rebirth. Uh, rebirth. So this is kind of this cycle for me and the dying and rising cycle is related of course to christ dying and resurrection sure sure and the purpose of you know building the strong ego and enlarging consciousness yeah so these are christian experiences life experiences that were, were difficult and yet important and necessary for my development yes and everyone's no doubt. And what do you th think we should call well, it? Well, I was going to start out by talking about Persephone's journey. Go That's ahead. a possibility or something along those lines. Okay. Because it's, it's going in and, you know, into the underworld and back into the light and into the underworld and back into the light. And it's kind of the mythology of my life. Her Great. Her, the image of her myth is... Uh, very personal to me. Could you just recap a little bit of what we were talking about in the earlier sessions? Well, we started the video by my sharing where I am in my life spiritually today. Mm -hmm. And that is with the rising of the divine feminine. And after that, we moved into my childhood and how there was the appearance of God in nature and a simple little cross that glowed in the dark as a child yeah. and some of some of the ways in which the spirit came to me in my younger years and then we went on into early adulthood with my conversion to christ and becoming baptized in the holy spirit which opened up a life of service in the world, taking people into our home and helping them out. Had you been baptized as an infant? No, I was baptized in the Methodist Church when I was 11. Uh, and my brother and sister were younger than I was, but all three of us were baptized at that time. I've been baptized many times. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> I've had many baptisms in different churches. <laughs> so, so your baptism into service, though, was at a later date. Is that right? That's right. This baptism in the Holy Spirit is uh, a, was a movement that began in the 60s and continued for many, many years. It was a global outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and it uh, happened to Christians all over the world in every possible church setting from the very conservative to the very uh, progressive. And what that did was to open up for me what you would call a living contact with God on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. I, I don't know if that could be called an establishment of the ego self-axis and having that ego self-axis alive and functional, but uh, I tend to think that that's certainly a possibility. Yeah, that sounds right to me. That definitely sounds right. Was there education involved in this baptism of the Holy Spirit? 
pretty much just reading books, participating in groups. There was a, a group here in Reno called the Sierra Ministries, and they brought major speakers in from across the country mm -hmm. to speak to us. And so we kind of, we were all kind of growing up together in this movement. There was no right. the, uh, written theology at that time, there is today. But we were all just having this experience of the Spirit welling up in us continuously. And so for seven years, my life was very alive. And uh, it seemed like every prayer was answered. It seemed like God and I were on the same page. Oh, terrific. It was, a, it was just a very alive time. And so that was ages what to what? It would have been when I was about 27 or 28 years old. And it, it extended for quite a long time, and I'm still in that period as we talk about this next stage mm -hmm. uh, where we're starting midlife today. Right. Okay, so we're going to go into the midlife cycle. I wanted to start by saying that Jung talks about finding your myth, or maybe it's Joseph Campbell talks about finding your myth. And over the years, I've come to see my myth as the Persephone myth where uh, her mother Demeter and loves her daughter Persephone just dearly, and Persephone is snatched into the underworld suddenly, and Demeter really causes great trouble in the world and is allowed to have Persephone return for six months every year to right. uh, the light. And so this next period of uh, midlife, it's from my age is about 30 to 55, there's a continuing cycle of dying and rising, of, of going into the underworld and then through some tremendous synchronicity rising in a very short period of time and then a time in the light in my opinion, a very short time, and then back down into the underworld and so forth. So, I think a lot of us, a lot of us, have had a lot of those dark times lately. <laughs> so, uh, I want to share those and the way in which God worked, and see if we can weave that in a bit with Jungian psychology. Right, and so we were talking about the Job archetype, so called, which Dr. Edinger and Dr. Young observed as contest, defeat, lamentation, and rebirth. And each time you go through that cycle, you get a stronger ego, so you're better able to handle the slings and arrows of life, basically. That's what we're talking about here. That's right. And as, as you, uh, when you're in the underworld, you're busy working, trying to keep your head above water. And all the lessons you learn in doing that are what help strengthen the ego. Right. And, and then you're up and on to the next thing. So the first thing I wanted to mention was, while well, I'm in my early 30s, we get a new pastor at our church. At that time, I was going to a congregational church. And this pastor offered counseling, and I began to go in for counseling. I think all the pain of my childhood and adolescence was just really coming up, and I was pretty uncomfortable and, and uh, anxious all the time and, and very disturbed in my feelings and so forth. And we began to meet on a weekly basis, and within maybe, I don't know, three to six months, there began to be a, a huge transference, counter-transference thing going on between the two of us, and it felt like we were connected by spirit, and it was a very deep and rich relationship for me. Between you and the pastor? Yes. Okay, and how, how would you define uh, transference and counter-transference? Well, the feeling aspect is that you're falling in love, Mm -hmm. And that this person carries for you the deepest meaning of life, and that connecting with them is what you've waited for all your life. I see. Okay, so, it, and, and of course, we know that that mm -hmm. happens between an analyst and analysands, but what I obse have observed in my own life is when my mother died, 
a lot of the feelings that I had about my mother transferred to my mother-in-law. And so mm. in a sense, she became my mother and, or the person that I deal with uh, as a mother in my, lovely. my later life, right? And, yes. and I, I realized that, you know, when, and this is what causes people to change partners and marriages, I suppose, too, that you fall in love with someone else. And <laughs> right. But, I mean, it doesn't only have to be love, in other words, is what I'm right. saying. It can, That's right. It, it can also be a, a mother and son relationship or a parent-child relationship or it can be a colleague relationship of yes. some sort. I mean, obviously, Jesus Christ had relationships with all of the apostles, and that was... Well, if not a peer relationship, it was certainly a relationship of a leader and followers. Yes, and right. certainly love was involved. And we have, Definitely. there are many women who were around him and supporting him. So we know that there was uh, a lot of love there too for the women. So his life was not simply restricted to the men. Right. Yes. And I was working in a business that was mostly women. And what I found is that the women were very supportive to me in a love sort of sense. I mean, not a physical love, but a, a love relationship of some yes. sort. That's right. Kind That's of an, right. Kind of the idea of an office wife, let's say. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's wonderful that you've experienced that from women. And, and so obviously Jesus Christ had a very similar uh, experience. And of course, Dr. Young had that experience because he had several women around him who are tongue-in-cheek referred to as the Valkyries. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I've heard that. Well, also, uh, there is a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot of, but there is suggestion that Mary Magdalene and Jesus may have had a close relationship uh, yes. that might have involved some romance and that kind of thing. There is a website. Uh, Margaret Starbird has written a book called women with the alabaster jar and we will have this image mm -hmm. at some point okay and so checking on her and her website she talks about the christian experience of union with god the divine masculine and divine feminine coming together right i i always have loved lloyd weber's song from Jesus Christ Superstar, which is, I don't know how to love him. Yes, I, right? I have sung that to Jesus many times. I'll bet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, and I because, well, as we go through, I'll talk more about this, but uh, because I had had this tremendous loving touch of God, this experience at the cellular level, then I wanted to love that way. And I mm -hmm. was continually disappointed in myself because I could not. So this, uh, what we're talking about now is where I'm going to find this out about myself in a big way. Right. So we're talking about your experience with the pastor. That's right. And mm -hmm. so at one point, it became a very addictive thing for me. If I was not in his presence, it was as if I was dying of thirst or starving or something like that. So I, I ended up spending a lot of time up at the church doing volunteer work, trying to catch his attention and get his input on my life in other ways. And at some point, that began to be very painful. And I recognized this isn't right. You know, mm -hmm. there's something that's out of balance here. And while I was feeling this unease, I was reading the scriptures in the story of Abraham and Isaac. And Abraham takes Isaac to offer him uh, because he loves God and he wants to please God regardless of the request that God asks of him. Mm -hmm. And I felt like God was saying, I'm asking you to make a sacrifice of this relationship. 
I'm asking you to let go of this relationship and the way in which you're approaching it. So the next time I saw the pastor, you know, I said, well, I feel like I need to back off from this. So I think I'm going to uh, uh, stop counseling for now. And I told him why. And within a week or two, he had put in his application again to go back into the Navy. He had had a heart attack and had been a Navy chaplain. And with a heart attack with your leg, he was booted out of the Navy quite quickly. Or Air Force, I'm sorry, Air Force. And so he was pastoring. So he had he had reconnected and was going back into the Air Force as a chaplain. They were taking him back in. He'd had enough healing where his heart was concerned and his health passed the test and all that. So that then I thought with my sacrifice I was going to be okay. But when he when I found out indirectly that he was leaving the church altogether. I went into a great decline and into, into some real grief. And for two years, I lived with a certain amount of grief, a fairly significant amount of grief and the loss of that intimacy. I had never known a loving intimacy like that. Growing up in an alcoholic home, it certainly wasn't available. And in my marriage at that time, it was not available. My husband also had become in trouble with the alcohol so and, and you were married at this time though. yes mm -hmm. yes we we'd been married for quite a number of years i can't think it was 18 years or something but quite a number of years mm -hmm. so we might take a look now at image 12 okay so in this state of grief which, of course, I could not discuss with my husband or my family or my friends. It, there felt like a certain amount of shame involved that I had crossed some kind of line. So we're on our way down to visit his parents in Pasadena, and we stop in the Mojave Desert. And I'm kind of moping around the desert, stretching my legs, and I come across this thorn bush. And it's this huge, gray, sharp thorn bush. And right in the middle of the bush is this tiny little flower that has managed to survive the darkness and all the thorns and to rise up to the sun. Mm -hmm. And it was a synchronicity for me. And we can look at the next slide, 11. Go back to 11. Either that night or the day before, I had been reading in Song of Songs and read Chapter 2, verse 2, like a lily among thorns is my darling among the maidens. And so as I am standing in front of the thorn bush, we could go back to that. I am experiencing, you know, a, a deep internal word of God. I call it a living word, which said, you know, you, I know you, I love you. You're in the thorn patch, but the light is shining on you. And it was a great word of comfort for me so generally in synchronicities following this particular period I began to see God intimately contacting me through love right and obviously a synchronicity is different than a coincidence a coincidence would be just something happens that was unexpected but you go on with your life and you never think anything else of it. But in this particular case, you were in the desert and you saw this flower and it expressed a special meaning to you. That's it. Exactly. That's right. I come to think of you have said the personal God does love us. And I think my life has been a long journey with this personal God who loves me. Right. So now I think we're going to go into some of the Persephone-like dying and risings. Let me ask you this question. Since we're talking about monotheism, how do you think of uh, the personal God then? How do you describe the personal God as opposed, and do you oppose that to the monotheist God? 
You know, I'm a much simpler person than the theologian. Uh, I have studied some theology, but my journey has been through religious experience, mm -hmm. through personal contact with God, through many different ways. Now, at this stage in my life, Jesus is what is highlighted because when I was sitting in that Black Friday service and God revealed that he knew me and loved me, even, you know, in other words, God was no longer impersonal in general, but very personal. Through that, for me, now today, people can't accept the atonement. But I can say more about that, how I, how I view it now myself. But for me at that time, I understood that God's love was most perfectly shown to me through Jesus giving himself for me, his life for me, that I could know the love of God. So Jesus was the central figure, and I was relating to Jesus. And I do that for quite a number of years. Mm-hmm. With the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit then came more into the picture. Uh, the Father I didn't have a lot of relationship with because my father was an alcoholic and God was a bit, the Father God was a bit scary to me. And, <laughs> <laughs> and fathers are frequently scary to their children. I don't, I don't have this in my outline, but it fits in well here, is that at one point in my journey, my son, this is when I'm probably in my 40s, but we're not going to talk about that uh, later, so I'll talk about it now. Anyway, my son was in great trouble and living in his car and just in great trouble in every possible way. And I was talking to my mother who lived in Minden, about it my dad got on the line and he said if you had raised him like i had raised you you wouldn't be having this problem well of course that struck me deeply and painfully and i said i can't talk to you now i have to hang up and i hung up the phone i was so hurt and so and anyway the story ends well uh, a few days later, I called and apologized for hanging up, and I said, Dad, you were hurting my feelings, and he apologized, and my mother told me later that in that earlier conversation, he had been drinking. So one day when I was struggling with accepting God's love because of my own humanness, I had a vision of God as a father, and he was laughing. And he was laughing, and, and I, in that vision, I knew, God, you're not an alcoholic. I mean, it sounds kind of funny, <laughs> but that was a great healing for me, you know. So the father kind of came in a little bit. So often on the different aspects that the Christians speak of uh, as Trinity have been experienced in different ways. So that, that's my idea of the Trinity. <laughs> okay. So we can go further now, shall sure, we? Sure, sure. All right. So uh, it's 1979, and I'm 35 years old, and I, uh, I'm having large fibroid tumors with excessive bleeding, and I'm going to have to have a hysterectomy. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things sad about that was that I wanted two more children, and that was going to put an end to that. But what I did not know was that you need hormone replacement very badly if you're that young mm -hmm. and you have a hysterectomy. So after the hysterectomy, my surgeon said he would be my gynecologist in the sense of prescribing the medications. My own gynecologist, had, his son, had committed suicide, and he had left the practice. Oh boy. I figured the surgeon would do fine, which was a very bad decision. And so I didn't have enough hor hormone replacement. And for seven years, I was in a deep clinical depression where I could barely get out of bed. Great disturbances in my brain, mm -hmm. uh, hanging on to life by my teeth and fingernails 
couldn't parent my children very well, had to teach them how to do the wash and things like that. And their teachers in school pretty much substituted as parents for me. And because their teachers were women, they stepped in to be kind of the mother figure. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that broke my heart so much was that I could no longer help people in the real world. The ministry of taking people in and helping them had to come to an end. So it was a great breaking for me in many ways. So during that particular time, I was in prayer and I was saying to Jesus how much I despaired of not being able to serve, to bring that love of God out into the world. And we can look at image 13. And the story, I was reading the scripture about this time, and there's a story about this woman that comes to Jesus named Mary. And she's of the Mary and Martha family in Lazarus. And she has this pint of nard, N-A-R-D, uh, a very expensive perfume. And she, it's just before Jesus is about to be crucified. And he says this is an image of his burial. You know, he's being anointed for his burial. Well, she poured all this very expensive ointment, all of it, on Jesus and wipes his feet, pours it on him, anoints him, and wipes his feet with her hair. That was my heart towards Jesus at that time, was I wanted to pour out my love as fully as possible through service in the world and was unable to do that. But what Jesus says in this story, I don't know if it's Judas or just generally the disciples, I think it was Judas said, you know, we could have sold that. Meaning she, if she just given us the alabaster box full of the pr precious perfume, we could have sold it and used the money for the poor. So there's that very practical money man, Judas. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, no, what she has done is a, a good thing, and it will be told of her forever. And so it was like Jesus was saying to me, just your loving me, just your desire to serve, is that precious ointment poured upon me, and I receive it, and I value it. Well, that is, that's uh, amazing image this picture is definitely an amazing painting yes this is by lee lawson down in the bay area i didn't come across the painting for many years after the experience i just related to you but when i saw it i had to have it and we had just sold one house and buying another and we had some extra cash so i was able to buy this and it hangs over my bed today oh wonderful yeah. It's, it's just a, a remarkable piece, really beautiful. Yes. And also during this time, when I was just feeling a great deal of despair over not being able to serve, I had another vision, and Jesus was in a little class, Sunday school classroom with toddlers. And it was like he was in charge of the toddlers. And he was sitting there just delighting in these little toddlers. And each little toddler had its own toy. They were peacefully playing with their own toy. And he was in seventh heaven just sitting there enjoying those little children. And what came to me was that even though I was ill and I could not serve, that just my very love for him pleased him. And the words that came to me in the vision were, isn't it okay if I just have some of my children with me? Saying to me that your being with me gives me great joy. Because I could see in the vision how joyful he was with those toddlers. Absolutely. Do you recall the verse that this relates to, the alabaster box? No, but if you put it in search, you'll get that. Okay, I'll find it. Okay. I should have thought to have a slide of that, but I... No problem. I'll, f I'll find it before I 
make the video. So the thing about this for me was that I was being given a meaningful task. So after this vision, I felt that my life had meaning, even though I was in a very desperate state health-wise and mentally, mm -hmm. you know, in just a very difficult place. So getting that meaning is so important to find the meaning of yeah. what, what's happening. And by finding the meaning, it makes the journey sacred. It turns the difficulty into something that has a beauty to it. Now that's one of the fundamental ideas of Jung, of course. That's really profound, actually. You know, in that vision of Jesus revealing to me that just my love for him delighted him, gave meaning to the suffering I was going through, and having that meaning brought a certain kind of beauty into the suffering. And, and that meaning made it bearable. All right, go ahead. Okay. The, this particular image that we were looking at, I find this image numinous. I mean, it, it strikes me very deeply, I'm you sure. You want to say more about that? I don't know what precisely it is. I can see a lot of different things in both the face of Mary and the face of Jesus. I can see Jesus looking inward at what this means to him. So because of the appearance of his eyes, it's captured a look that I've seen occasionally, but when when you see this look, you know somebody is looking inside, not outside. Yes. Um, one of the famous pictures of Dr. Jung, which is in one of his, one of the books, one of the letters books, there's a picture of him with this kind of expression where you can see, I mean, he's looking right at the camera, except you know that he's not looking at the camera. You know he's looking inside. Yes. And, so there's that element to it. And also in terms of the eyes, in Mary's eyes, there's, there's very definite adoration in those eyes, just the yes. eyes. The image is remarkable in that way, number one, just because of the eyes. And then number two, it's remarkable because it captures a luminescence, which is luminous. The hands to me, say something about how touched he is to have her there with him. Because of my experiences in the Middle East, the veil that she's wearing, of course, suggests a hijab that you would see on modern Muslim women. That has so many different meanings to me personally, but obviously the major one is not a submission but a voluntary it's a voluntary step into maturity as a woman and taking her role in the community and it implies in modern muslim women it implies that she's a adult woman and is stepping into maturity and is taking her role as a mature woman in her culture rather than i think a lot of people think of it as submission and i know in the catholic church of course they veiled for years I, I don't know if catholic women are still veiling i think they probably are by habit but i think they're not required to veil anymore that's an old tradition and there's oh my goodness i just i just have too many Associations, many associations with that. Well, it would, it would be good, as you know, to sit with that. Yeah. And see what else emerges. I think I like what you said. It's not submission. For me, it is a surrender. It is the surrender of the ego to the self. Mm -hmm. it, and this picture for me is one of the pictures for me of sacred marriage that is towards the end of one's life if one is fortunate to live long enough. Right.
and not to die in the process of dying and rising. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your sharing. That's so touching to me. And the coming of age as an adult woman means a great deal to me because in a certain sense, now in my 70s, I feel I've come of age somehow in a new way. Well, it definitely feels like that. And yeah. also, another aspect of this that's very impressive to me is the way the artist has captured the light on the, on the chalice and on the box. Yes, right. Uh, captured the, the idea of Mother of Pearl on the box, which is very special. I mean, I, as an artist myself, I look at that box and I say, how is that done? Yes. How is that even achieved? It's not easy. <laughs> no, it's not. Well, too, one of the things for me, too, he's holding the cup of his blood. Mm -hmm. And she's holding the cup of her blood, in a sense. Her life poured out is the, her blood. Yes. I think it's an it's a incredible, numinous piece, and I think many people will be touched by it. Well, this lives within each of us. Right. This, this um, ma divine masculine and divine feminine live within each of us. Surely. And something I didn't mention uh, in the first segment we did, when the divine feminine arose for me, it was like I was let out of prison because the divine fully, I was fully met as a woman, mm -hmm. whereas I had been in the very masculine Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit assumed to be masculine. And at, you can see, even though I did not have that divine feminine image at the time that I, we were just recently talking about, I was receiving a tremendous amount of numinosity and personal growth and spiritual growth for this rising of the Divine Feminine to have happened in my life just the summer of 2019, just shortly after you and I met. Mm -hmm. So this is quite new to me, but I am, I am free and healed and made whole uh, in a tremendous way by this interaction with the Divine Feminine. Dr. Jung talked about it being integration Incarnation. I mean, this is the incarnation of the divine feminine, which is the integration of it into your own psyche, I guess. Yes, is, right. That's the way. I mean, you can hear about it. As Job said in the Bible, now, before I heard of you of the, from the hearing of my ears, but now I see thee. And, yes. And when he said, see, he wasn't talking about seeing this way. Right. He was talking about seeing internally, inwardly. Yes. He was experiencing what I call the oneness of God or union with God. Right. Yes. Okay, so I've been in the dying cycle. Now to, now to the good news. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you see how rich the dying cycle was. Surely. So now our family is experiencing the dynamics of an alcoholic family like I grew up in, but very different. Uh, my husband was what they called a European alcoholic, which is someone who drinks a lot every day, but not enough to hinder their ability to go to work and to do a good job. And what it does relationally is that there, it, the emotional and physical interaction of the couple in a very dull and diluted sense. And so we were in real trouble. And after the pastor left, and I had to deal with and face that my marriage was not what I had hoped for, that we needed to do some work on this. One day I was just in tears, just sobbing in my den, my office, in the home. And my husband came in to see what was wrong. And I said, you know, I just can't bear this anymore. And that day he called a treatment center. And these were very popular at this time. This would have been, I think, in the 80s now. The government was paying for treatment 
for people with drug and alcohol abuse. And he went into an outpatient program for uh, alcoholic treatment. And part of the family treatment, we were all being treated. There were family nights, and we all went, and the kids went to Al-Anon, and I went to, or they went to Alateen, I went to Al-Anon, and uh, my husband was in his own situation with, with what he was dealing with. Mm-hmm. And in my, in my track for healing, we had a depression group. And, of course, I picked that right. <laughs> One of my chaps came up for that. I I signed up. And as I was sharing in the group, a nurse said to the psychiatrist, has Nancy been tested for her hormones? And so he immediately had that test done and found out I had very few of the female hormones and that this was responsible for this seven years of serious clinical depression that had gone undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. And so I was put on a medication, and within a month, I was fine. In one month, I was wow. fine. So this rising, I found in my life the risings can be pretty fast and rather dramatic. Mm-hmm. But, of course, I had to deal with anger and uh, frustration over the fact that seven years of my life had been a kind of living torture. But I was happy to be out of it. <laughs> I was not going to complain in any way. So I started a time management business for leaders, and I was able to do that for two years. And then we started another dying cycle. So I, was, I, I had been able to work with uh, all kinds of leaders, pastors in particular, but also attorneys and different other people, to help them find quality of life for themselves and their families. And so I was succeeding. I was, a, I was serving and I was being paid for it. And this was good. So one day in the midst of a large consultation I was doing, I couldn't get out of bed and did not know what, what the problem was. And I could not get out of bed for six months. Now for about three of those months, we didn't know what it was. And to be that ill, I mean, I couldn't. Sometimes my husband had to carry me from the bed to the couch and then back in the night. I was just, you know, very, very ill. And my friends and my husband thought I was dying. I didn't think that, but I sure knew things were pretty serious. And my husband even said to me, he's embarrassed about it now, but he said, we need you to get up and work and provide, you know, help provide the income for this family. Well, he had no idea what, what I was experiencing. I simply was completely exhausted, so exhausted that I could feel the air pressure, the natural muscles that handle that air pressure we never think of in normal life. But in such a state of weakness, I could feel the air pressure as a significant pressure. As you you look back on it now, is it is it something that you can diagnose, or it was psychological? You think it was psychological, or well, here comes the synchronicity. Here comes the love of God. Okay. (laughs) So a friend of mine picked me up. I was having a better than better than average day. And I was able to get dressed, and she picked me up and took me to a Bible study. And at the end of the, it was a women's Bible study, and at the end of the study, there was a prayer time where people gave prayer requests. And one of the people listed the symptoms of her son and said that this was Epstein-Barr virus. And so I, I took notes, and I called my doctor immediately the next day. And he did a blood test and confirmed that it was the Epstein-Barr virus. And in, wow. six, in six months, I would be well. So that was a great encouragement. There again, seeing God's hand, the personal God who loves us, seeing right. that, meeting me in a very practical way. So being taken to the prayer group and they're learning the solution to your physical ailment. Exactly. Wow. 
And, and yeah. what is Epstein Barr virus? I've never heard of it. Well, uh, it's a virus that we know more often as co the cause of mononucleosis. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Okay. So uh, in six months, I was much better. Now, if my doctor had been wise, he would have said, Now I want you to take this next year very quietly. But I was bursting to serve and, and to get back on my horse. And at this point, I wanted to go to seminary. My pastor at the time, I was in an evangelical church at this time called the Evangelical Free Church. And my pastor suggested some, had suggested I attend certain classes uh, that taught the personality inventory called the DISC, D-I-S-C. Have you run into that? No. Did you run into that in the army? No. Well, it's a little bit like the Myers Briggs, and by defining the personality types, for instance, the D would be a Donald Trump, mm -hmm. and I would be an Obama. That's just to give a general idea. Yeah. Uh, so he he told me that he thought I could improve on my time management by going to his seminary, which was Fuller Seminary down in Pasadena and considered on the uh, level of Stanford in terms of a Christian educational institution, so one of the best. And they had a program where you could go down for a week and then come home and over the month work through your projects that you had and then go back for another week and so forth. So I did that for a while and studied church consulting which is basically organizational development, but with a very uh, detailed and uh, unique approach to the church itself, to the way a church functions. Mm -hmm. So I had started, then I, I was accepted to be on one of the premier consulting teams out of the Fuller Seminary. And I was the one, I was the person who would come in and teach about prayer and teach about maturity in Christ and that kind of thing and also be in be in prayer and discernment through the consultation to be able to pro provide feedback to the consultants who were much more in the T realm the thinking function realm Mm -hmm. Whereas I was in the feeling function realm, and I could provide that feeling function feedback for them. So after an, a, a time of that, I was doing well enough to start consulting on my own. And I had just finished consulting a 500-member church, which is a, considered a very large church. About 80, over 80% 80 of the churches are 50, about 50 members. So many we don't tend to think of that we hear about these giant churches of several thousand but those are very very small percentage of the number of churches that exist in our nation today yeah i can't remember now just how long this was if this was a year or two it was a fairly short period of time i woke up again unable to get out of bed and this time I thought, well, you know, what's going on now? So nobody could diagnose it again. And later it came, to, I finally, God led me, I'm sure, to this doctor, or someone referred me to him, who knew about the chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome. So this is, quite, this is it's not unusual for someone who's had the Epstein-Barr virus to later suffer from, uh, today they call it chronic fatigue syndrome, or myalgic encephalomyelitis. When you hear that, just generally chronic fatigue syndrome, you just think, well, I get real tired too. <laughs> this is a whole other level. I see, yeah. Yeah. So, um, oh, I should say one thing uh, while I was going to the seminary, that there was a notice on the bulletin board. It's so interesting how synchronicities come to me. I just happened to be perusing a bulletin board while I was waiting to see one of my favorite seminary teachers. And what was being offered was a seminar on Young, Adler, and Erickson. Hmm. And, I've, 
I thought, well, that might be interesting. And I could not understand Jung's writings. But mm -hmm. I love biography. And so I came upon Memories, Dreams, and Reflections and read that. So that was a beginning introduction there to just realizing that some of my experiences uh, could be related in the psychological area through the way Jung had lived his life and what he had experienced. And I felt kind of a kinship with the man at that point, but I was on to other things. And so that kind of went on to a back shelf. About what year was that? 86, 87 maybe, something like that. But with reading that book, there was a shift in consciousness for me. Mm -hmm. There was an enlargement of, of consciousness that my spiritual experiences were also related to my humanness, which included the psyche. So there was an enlargement of consciousness just for having read his book. Uh, we can go to image number 14. Well, let's, let me just say that this chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome lasted nine and a half years. So wow. It was a very long period of dying. But I have, I have some beauty to share from that and within that. And we can look at image number uh, 14, monasticism. So one day, uh, on a day that I was having a better than average day, my daughter came over. I lived in sweats, but they were a shocking pink. <laughs> and, uh, so I had on my shocking pink sweats, and she came in and said, Mom, put on your coat. I'm taking you to the used bookstore. And so we went, and down in the very back corner, away from everything else, were the, was a small religious section. And I was looking at the backs, the spines of the books, and saw the title, The Seven Story Mountain. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And then I saw the name Thomas Merton, and I remembered I had been introduced to Merton in college, something we had read, which I did not care for particularly, actually. I think it was No Man Was an Island, and I was too young for that. Didn't have a spiritual context for it. So I pulled that book off the shelf and took it home. And it's this, he's, he's 27 years old when he writes this autobiography. Mm. And he was a devil before he became uh, enlightened, shall we say, through his Catholicism. And it was just before the World War II started, just be, it may have he, start, he, he started his Catholic journey in his mid-twenties, I believe, and had decided to, to become a Trappist monk. He had visited the Trappists in Louisville, Kentucky, and felt that was the place he was being drawn. And it was just shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, I believe, that he went into the Trappist Seminary. I, I don't remember how long it was before he wrote The Seven Story Mountain, but it is his autobiography of faith, and I can recommend it to everyone. And even though uh, there's some Catholicism in there that might be objectionable to some, it's a very interesting individuation journey at, from his, you know, at his age. And the shift in him going from simply being a worldly person without a spiritual center to having becoming a man with a spiritual center. So I got interested in monasticism through him. And one of the phrases, so I'm very ill. It's been probably five years into the chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome. I'm still fighting it. I'm still unhappy about it and straining and struggling around it, unable to read the Bible, unable to go to church, unable to go to have any fellowship of any kind. So without, without spiritual support, so I'm, I'm in a pretty dark place, pretty painful place. And I read something that says, this is in monasticism, this probably goes back to the Desert Fathers of the 300s, 200s, 300s. Stay in your cell, and your cell will teach you everything. The cell meaning their little room in the monastery, and to the desert fathers, maybe a cave, a cave that they lived in. 
Mm. And, and it meant uh, going into silence and into your inner life and what comes up dealing with that which comes up and bringing that darkness into the light. So really a time of encountering the shadow in a meaningful way in, in, with a spiritual center. Mm-hmm. And as I read that particular line, stay in your cell and your cell will teach you everything, I thought, this illness is my cell. And I knew a couple of scriptures that I had, I, I w- had over many years just really thoroughly immersed myself in the scriptures, both the Hebrew and the Christian. So I knew I had many scriptures within me that would come to mind when needed. And as I read that particular line, your cell, stay in your cell and your cell will teach you everything, two of those scriptures came to mind, and I can't tell you what they were, but one of them was that Jesus said, I came to bring life and that in abundance. Oh, that's and John 10.10. John 10. Okay. And the other one is in one of Paul's letters, and or John's letters, I'm not sure which letter, and it says, God will complete the work that God has begun in you. And what this meant to me was that I could find abundant life in my cell, and God would continue in my cell of illness to complete the work he had begun in me. And that this was more important than anything I could do in the outer world was this inner development. So this gave meaning to the suffering again. Mm -hmm. And having that meaning strengthened me then for four and a half more years of the same. I can't say how, you know, I see this looking back on it as the beauty in suffering, the finding of the meaning in the suffering. And I think having a spiritual center is essential for this kind of finding this meaning. Yeah, very, very definitely. And of course, there's so many young men that follow my channel, but not only my channel, but all YouTube, about 80% are young men. And they're between, typically they're between 18 and 34. And I think a lot of them are right now struggling with this because they haven't had a father who might have given them better guidance, I suppose. This is a role that this uh, Jordan Peterson, Dr. Jordan Peterson, has filled in for many young men, I think, brilliantly, might add. Well, one thing I'd like to mention, since you've brought that up, what is important is the inner movements that we have within us that are the stirrings of the deep self in my in the personal god of love is drawing us to become the person we were created to be and to make the contribution we were given to make in this world and all of us have that within us and be helped then to notice those inner movements and one spiritual discipline is the spiritual discipline of Lectio Divina, L-E-C-T-I-O-D-I-V-I-N-A. And you bring yourself to a scripture. It could actually be a poem or a story. And you, I'll, I'll use scripture because that's my practice. To come to a passage of scripture and to read it, no more than say, 10 verses. You don't want to read a whole chapter necessarily. And just read it first. And then just sit back and think about what you've read. I should say also, before you start, you should come into a quiet place, maybe some deep breathing. You're alone. It's quiet. It might only be the bathroom for young mothers. Yes. (laughs) Or fathers, young fathers to have some, some, some private space. And once you're settled, you're feeling more settled, then you bring yourself to whatever writing you are re- with, something mm-hmm. meaningful to you. And you've read that short passage and you've thought about it, and then you read it a second time 
to see what draws you. Is there a particular part, a word, a phrase, a verse itself that you resonate with? And that's starting to notice the inner movement. Sure. And, and so you sit back and you kind of wonder about that. Why is that word or phrase or text really, why am I resonating with this on this day at this time in my life? What is the message of God to me? Or what is the message of the deep self? What is the message of the spiritual center to me today? And you ponder that. And then you go back and you read the passage a third time and see if the same thing is stirred or if something else begins to move within you and you begin to resonate with something else. And you continue that as long as there is some kind of life coming up in you and you're meeting something else. You're meeting something you can't put a name on, you can't label, but there is some kind of interaction taking place from that deep inner center and what you yourself as a human being in that moment in time, in that room, with that book, is happening. The deep rivers within us are revealing themselves to you and that you are known, you are loved, you are guided, and there be a, a living word to that person. And that's much different than studying the Bible study point of view, where you're trying to understand the background and the meaning and the context uh, and all this. That, that's more logos. Right. But when you bring yourself to a passage that's meaningful to you and read it in this way, you have a, a what is it, a I can't think of the word, but it's now time. Yeah. The now time. Epiphany. You have an epiphany, maybe. You do. Now, right. the, in the intensity of that numinous experience can be quite subtle, mm -hmm. but it is there. Or it can be, you know, quite, quite tremendously numinous. And just, you know, you just are stunned and just sit there. and It takes months and years to digest. So... The intensity yeah, I mean, of the numinosity varies. <laughs> yeah, that's been happening to me a lot lately because in Jungian psychology, we're talking about the psyche, and that's not logos. I was I was thinking about John one one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word yeah. was God. And of course, both Protestant and Catholic. Theologians use that a lot, and the experience I was having with Paul Vanderclay, who I became interested in because of his interest in Jordan Peterson and Jordan Peterson's sort of incomplete or one-sided interest in Jung, I said, you know, I understand the logos but didn't anything happen after the beginning what happened after the beginning mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if if the beginning was the word fine i'll accept that but then what and the reason i was resisting it was because of B bishop baron who had this interview this conversation with jordan peterson and he says he's the chairman of a committee of Catholic bishops whose job it is to bring people back in the church. And the results they're getting are that they're losing six for every one they bring in. Mm -hmm. And as a businessman, I say, wow, that's not a very good sales manager. What's wrong with this picture? You know? yes. So I said, there must've been something that happened since the beginning. Because of that question, I went back and I opened John 1.1 1, 1, and I started to read and holy cow, you know, by the time you get to John 1.4, you realize that it's not about the word at all. It's about the light and the life. And that's not logos. Okay. That's not logos. That's an experience. Yes. And they've lost track of that. 
and the same is true of on the Protestant side, where I've listened to quite a number of Paul Vanderclay's presentations. He makes terrific arguments. He's extremely erudite about particularly Calvinist theology, but all theology. So he makes these oral arguments, and I, as an attorney, I recognize them as an oral argument. Man, this is, he's trying to convince a jury here, right? And so he's trying to do it logically, so that's logos. And you know, I've heard a lot of those in courtrooms, so I recognize that this is a logical argument he's making, but the, but the point is that's not his business. He's not in the business of convincing a jury. He's a, in the business of helping people understand the experience of God. That's true. That's very, very true. That's so insightful of you to see that. Where we find the life and the light is in the contemplative side of the church. And you could bring up slide number 15. So this is our Carmelite monastery here in Reno in the winter, last uh, probably January or something like that. And this is where I go to once a week to have uh, the services with the sisters. It starts with morning prayer, and then we go into the service, the regular services. A friend of my husband's uh, at the time had a wife who had been a Carmelite. And she, they were over for dinner, and she started talking a bit about her background as a Carmelite nun. And she was so funny. I, w I wish I could imitate her. But, <laughs> I mean, she, she was, the, she'd, she'd left the monastery to get married, and she'd been, she was doing uh, ballerina lessons, and she was probably in her 60s or 70s at the time. She was quite a gal. But anyway, you know, I was going through a, a difficult period, and I thought, you know, maybe I could get some help at the monastery. So the novice mistress, that's the person who works with and trains the new nuns, mm -hmm. was willing to meet with me. Uh, I, I called her my spiritual director. She said, no, she was a, a what was it she said? Uh, a traveler on the journey with you is how she put it. And so I would go up and talk with her and pour out my heart. And one day she, I, I, I said, you know, I feel like the little sparrow, the old hymn, his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. And she said to me, and she had this spiritual power behind it, you are that sparrow. And that touched me so deeply. It, it, you know, I was so in this fog of illness all of a sudden, I was that bird held in the hand of God, just mm -hmm. with those simple words. And through my relationship with her, I be began to get more involved in going and started going to daily services. So I discovered the contemplative path. And the contemplative path is the path that I've mentioned before that began with the Desert Fathers, the early Christians before Christianity was legalized. Would you call the contemplative path also the uh, mystical path? The mystic I would say yes. Christian mysticism. I would say yes. Mm -hmm. Yes okay. to that. Because it's in the silence that going deep within, encountering the shadow, bringing the light of God, dealing with, I mean, as you know, facing the shadow is no picnic. <laughs> yeah. Not all uh, unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> That's right. That's right. The contemplative path. So here's another broadening of consciousness. Now as a Protestant, I'm being brought into the Catholic stream. And what happened at the at Martin Luther's Reformation is that the baby got thrown out with the bathwater and that change and the contemplative life and that deep resting in God, and that deep working of the, what we would call the unconscious, making conscious and integration, kind of got lost. Right. But, but with my introduction to the Carmelites, I, I did want to mention just a couple, three books that people might be interested in. 
from the Christian contemplative way. There's this book called Carmelite Way by John Welch. And he understands the Jungian psychology. So you will find in here a relating of this contemplative path to Jung psychology, the ego, the shadow, and so forth. Another fellow who's also very familiar with Jung is Thomas Keating in this book, The Human Condition. It's just a small little book. You can see it wouldn't take mm -hmm. long to read, but I recommend that for anyone, mm -hmm. regardless of religion, regardless of faith, regardless of spiritual connection. And he has many, many books on centering prayer, which is, is his name for the contemplative way. And then for those who are really seriously interested in it and want something in depth, this is Into the Silent Land by Martin Laird, L-A-I-R-D. And this actually gives detailed instructions on contemplative prayer from the Christian tradition. Now, he brings in many Eastern practices as well because the contemplative way, starting with the early Christians and the Desert Fathers, was very much compatible with many of the Eastern teachings of meditation and going into silence and learning to deal with the ego and the sure. shadow and this kind of thing. So through my contact with the Carmelites, first with that book by Merton and then meeting the Carmelites, and this really helped me in a tremendous way to open up consciousness. And we can go to image 16. This is St. Therese of Lisieux, uh, a, a French nun of the 19th century. Catholics know her as the little flower. And she was a nun who did small things with great love. And our mother Teresa, who passed away, in the 90s, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta mm -hmm. brought that saying along, do small things with great love. Uh, and my no the novice mistress recommended I read her autobiography called The, the Story of a Soul. And there are many different versions of it. Some are pretty hard to read. They're too, too uh, what would you say, too flowery, too much trying to make a case for this saint. But there are some that are very real and, and uh, write the story that she was an actual girl and woman and her struggles and trials and so forth. So in reading the book, The Story of the Soul, I was in bed one night and I just finished the book. I was very ill and I let the book rest on my stomach. And I just said, oh God, thank you. And I said, kind of out loud in a way to her but not intentionally speaking to someone who had died that was not to do in, in my particular expression of faith you don't talk to the dead who are back that's the devil in disguise so anyway uh i had just said i'm so glad to meet you i'm so glad to having met you and the next instant she was there kneeling by the bed loving me Mm -hmm. with this same deep, rich, penetrating, all-encompassing love that I had experienced in that wow. time much earlier in my conversion experience. And I said, I said, Jesus, tell her thank you, because <laughs> I didn't dare talk to her myself. Mm. And I said, please tell her thank you so much. And then Jesus appeared. So Jesus was standing there behind Therese of Lisieux, and she kept ministering to me this incredible love as a woman. This mm -hmm. was a connection now. I, I can only relate to it now from my position today. This was probably my first encounter in Christianity of the Divine Feminine. I find this painting also very powerful and numinous. And as you've been speaking about this experience of yours, I'm just looking at the painting, and this can happen with many paintings, but it moves, she moves, and it, 
it takes on a life of its own, which means that it's obviously connecting with something in my deep unconscious also when that happens. But Can you say any more about that? Are, are you in touch with any? Well, that it's touching. Well, first of all, the eyes are very penetrating. You know, I'm not sure that I have a a strict handle on on what it is, but I I certainly see, for example, her cheeks seem to broaden or change as if she was smiling and almost winking at me with the <laughs> right her right eye and. And I actually find this with many watercolor paintings, that they're not perfect in the Rembrandt sense, but they're, they cause your eye to move around the painting so that, for example, you saw the one I did recently. They cause your eye to move around the painting, and therefore they take on a life of their own, actually. And it's as if I'm looking into her into her wish for something good for me right. and so I, I mean I, I think that you could probably write a lot about that I bet this is a beautiful painting where did you find this this was painted by sister Sarah at the Carmelite monastery that I go to wow and she, she's, she's she a had, She's had a uh, professional training as an artist. Yeah, well, she's, she's from Korea. Uh -huh. yeah. She's obviously very talented and very much it? so. And you can see her expressing her faith through Surely. this painting. Oh, very definitely. And I would invite you, you know, when you feel led to come to this painting and be with it and to consider it as a personal contact with a personal God of love for you mm -hmm. who sees you knows everything that you've ever been through has your all your aches and pains all your great disappointments and heartbreaks and the love of God is there for you with a right. healing love your story also reminds me of another story of Dr. Jung in which although he was a, a Protestant and a this was Reformed Protestant. He had a vision of a crucifix on his wall, which wasn't actually there, but he had this vision of it, and he had a vision of it with Christ on the cross, and it was very meaningful to him. I think that experience is actually given in Memory Stream's reflections, if I recall, is where I've seen it. So it sounds very much like you had a parallel experience. If they can take that into themselves as meaningful to them personally and understand it as a touch from the greater personality, yes. from, from the deep center, that they are known and right. cared for. Right. Yeah. So this was the cross that I uh, was holding in my hands one night. I'd reached the absolute end of my ability to cope, and I was pondering this particular cross, and I felt just like this. I felt there was no life in, left in me. I couldn't go on. I was just really, the image there was very much mirroring my inner state. And all of a sudden, I thought, wait a minute. I feel just like that, but I'm alive. I'm breathing. And then I thought, and he's alive in me. Spirit Precisely. is alive. Precisely. And I, and I began to have this glimmer of hope that maybe there was going to be a way forward. And Precisely. And of course, this is the, the fundamental idea that uh, Dr. Jung brings up of the crucifixion representing wholeness. Yes, but first the crucifixion. <laughs> yeah, for, I mean, it's, it's, it's crucifixion first, but it's understanding the opposites of making. Yes, that's and, it. And bringing in the wholeness of, of the human experience. That's exactly right. Okay, so with this glimmer of hope, we start to move towards a rising. We're not quite there yet, but uh, between this particular 
uh, experience and the beginning of the rising, I had a couple of very important synchronicities occur. And they both involved junk mail. So, oh, really? <laughs> so I have to say, be prepared for, uh, you know, God coming to you through just about any avenue. Interesting. So the first, now, had I not been ill, I would not have looked at each piece of junk mail. But when you're very ill and you don't have much stimulation, even the junk mail, it's an event in the day. Interesting. So I'm going through the junk mail, and there's this little green piece of paper with a staple in it, which means it was a mass mailing and unusual. And I didn't recognize the the people that had sent it or anything, but it was enough to get my attention, and I opened it. And it was uh, talking about a particular ministry. I hope the name of it comes to my mind, because they have a wonderful website. In the listing of what they had in there was a cassette tape by a Marist brother, a Catholic Marist brother. It's a teaching order. He had a tape in there called a Spiritual Direction, and Jungian psychology. And because of my introduction to Jung with that book many, many years before, that caught my attention. And because I had been seeing the novice mistress at the monastery and thought of her as spiritual director, spiritual direction interested me. Mm -hmm. And so I sent for that cassette tape, tells you how many years ago that was, right. and, uh, and listened to it. It was exactly what I needed to hear. It put together so many of the struggles I was having, you know, emotionally, psychologically, and it indicated a path forward. And I thought, boy, if only I could get down to the Mercy Center. He's no longer at that particular location, but he was at the time. Mercy Center is in Burlingame, California, in the Bay Area. If only mm -hmm. I could get down there and meet with him, I could get well. That was the thought that came to my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, knowing, I mean, I was so sick, I kind of dismissed it, but I had thought it seriously, and that counts as a prayer and request to God. So I don't know if it was a month later or, or uh, not very long later, another piece of junk mail, a sample of a magazine was sent to me. And not having anything to do, and this being one of the high events of my day, <laughs> <laughs> was something interesting in the junk mail. I was going through it and saw this little strip down the side of a page that talked about the Academy of Spiritual Formation. And it said they would take handicapped people and you would go for two years. You'd go down for a week and then you'd come home for three months and you'd go down for a week and come home for three months. This was put on by the Methodist Church. Mm-hmm. And the whole thing was to give you an experience of monastic living hmm. and, and to get you into this cycle of silence and prayer and community and so forth. So this drew me greatly. So because they took the handicapped, I dared to hope that I might be able to get down there and go. Well, I had been ill now for about nine and a half years and the disease itself had lightened just enough that I thought I could you know if somebody helped me to get on the plane if I had someone meet me with a wheelchair get me on the plane wheel me from the wheelchair to the baggage department get my baggage and help me get a taxi to the Mercy Center if I flew into the San Francisco airport it's just 10 minutes I think to, to the Mercy Center from there, that I could do it. And so I get myself to the Mercy Center, which is uh, an order of nuns also, I'm trying to think, well, they're the Mercy Sisters, of course, that had this, and it used to be uh, that they had a very large number of nuns, which of course, after Vatican II, this decreased a good deal. So they were using the little cells of the nuns for rooms for the retreatants that came. And so I can we di diverge for a moment and sure. tell me what tell me why they didn't have fewer nuns after Vatican II? Yes, well with Vatican II, they the uh, Pope John the 23rd 
asked all of the orders to go back to the founders and to find out what it was the founders really brought. And of course, what the founders brought was a a very significant, numinous experience of God through their own lives. Right. And as the orders began to reflect on the Middle Ages type of life they were living and how they were missing this vital life that their orders had been started by, many, many of them left the orders. With just, they just could no longer live the Middle Ages type of monastic life. Hmm. Because the nuns weren't having the same numinous experience. Well, I, I can't say that for sure, because, uh, but it just, it, what the Middle Age style of mm-hmm. monasticism in the modern age was not working for them. I see. Interesting. I digress. Sorry. Now, I'm not a historian of that, and, and if you spoke to a nun who went through it, they might tell you a little different story. That's my, that's my take as an outsider mm-hmm. looking at it. So I'm at the Mercy Center. I am so, so exhausted by the time I get to the door, and they have heavy, tall wood doors that I could hardly open the door. So I'm very weak just getting there. Somehow I managed to get the door open just enough to put a foot in and then my elbow in to open it enough to bring in my little suitcase on rollers and get myself to the desk and find my room and barely was able to get to my room. It was a bit of a walk. Collapsed on the little bed, just a little single bed, a small table with a lamp, a window, and an easy chair like I'm sitting in now. That was all very compact little room. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were shared bathrooms in a hallway. You did have a little sink in your room to wash your face and brush your teeth. And I just collapsed on the bed, and I was meeting with Brother Don Basson, you know, let's say in an hour or two, and I was hoping I'd have energy to do that. And I was hoping that we would meet, he would heal me, and I would be well that (laughs) night. (laughs) Right. So expectations, you know, get you into troubles. I remember a military saying about the word assume, which you may know. Yes. (laughs) Of course. <laughs> we'll leave that one as we'll leave that one for people to look up on the internet. But <laughs> anyway, so I went down with great expectation that evening to meet with him. And he rushed in, he sat down, he said, I can only stay a minute. One of the brothers has died and I've got to get is dying and I've got to get to the hospital. So my heart sunk down into my shoes. But he said, pay attention to your dreams tonight. And then off he went. So <laughs> I was feeling so downhearted. But I, the bookstore was open. They had have a lovely bookstore there at the center. And I went into the section on dreams. And I picked up a couple of books. One of them is called... Something like Let Your Body Interpret Your Dreams by Eugene Gendlin. Mm -hmm. And the other is A Little Book of Dreams, and I can't remember the author of that. So I read those books, and that stimulated, I think, the unconscious to produce a dream. And the dream that came to me that night portrayed all the great pain I had around my marriage, around the lack of intimacy, And that's what I took to him for spiritual direction the next day. So we had a full hour that that morning. And he he was so compassionate and understanding about uh, what I was suffering. And he mirrored that back to me in such a way that I saw my suffering. I mean, I knew I wasn't happy, but I didn't know... I didn't have, I hadn't put words on the why of it. And now I had words for that. And I felt seen at a deep level and known at a deep level with compassion. And that in itself was very healing. So he dismissed me and said, pay attention to your dreams tonight. So that night I was reading the little book of dreams. And in that book, he talks about 
eating poison that some in some dreams there's a poison that you're asked to ingest and it's a healing poison that when you take when you take that and eat that in a dream that it will bring healing and i need that was a synchronicity i didn't know at the time would be a synchronicity but that night i had this spectacular dream this was numinosity on the hundred percent scale mm. big as it comes a complete rearrangement of my psyche in some way and the in the dream i'm asked to eat this excrement that is covering this divine child in the sky i'm in a gondola in venice at night and this divine child glowing child appears to me covered in excrement and i know i need to eat some of that because somehow in the dream i remember what i read the night you know that night so i take a big taste of it and all of a sudden everything changes everything takes on light joy all the sor all the uh, repressed sexuality in from my current situation in my marriage erupted and it was quite an erotic dream of all particular kinds and at one point i'm going is this okay and <laughs> and brother don basan comes into the dream and says yes it's okay and so it was it was quite and the final scene was of me making love to myself uh -huh. interesting oh yes go ahead well, I just, um, you're reminding me of uh, a scene in the Red Book where uh, Dr. Jung is told that he has to eat the liver of a, of a dead girl, a small dead girl. Oh, yes. Uh, which is very, uh, I mean, it's reminiscent of, of your dream. Yes. And, and I, wonder if, I wonder if he did and if that brought oh, a did. deal of light. Did that, yeah. you know, if a great deal of light I, followed I, that? I don't really recall, but I, I suspect it did because it's in the red book. But <laughs> but I, I'll have, yes. I'll, you've 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 sparked my curiosity, so I'm going to go back and find that passage. I'd like to so know too. Next, yeah, next time we'll talk. Uh, I'll okay. bring it. So I the next morning I wake up well. I had come in with a cane, barely able to get around. I am surging with energy from head to toe i am angry i'm angry yes i'm waking up well there i am yeah i'm waking up well and i throw my cane away and i go charging around the mercy center grounds as if i was you know in fine shape Mm -hmm. Now, my body was not in fine shape, so I paid for it later. <laughs> but uh, in that particular morning, I just charged around this beautiful, beautiful walking path designed by Father Thomas Hand, who uh, was in, the, in Asia, did his ministry in Asia, and brought to it the beautiful sensitivity of the Japanese for gardens. Mm -hmm. And that path was, was just beautiful very very meaningful so that picture you just showed let's go back to that uh, yeah. 18 i want to say something about the image in behind it yes so this is me letting the unconscious put down that miracle this is the miracle mm -hmm. and this is what was in me that came out and this is i had had some teaching on painting in the indigenous australian style with the dots yes and so the 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 kind of reddish circles outside the large central circle are campsites i see and at each campsite it represents a period of my life and next to each campsite, there is there are arrows which stand for the painful events of my life, mm -hmm. and there are little blue petaled flowers that stand for the light moments of my life. And in each of these major times of my life, there were both both mm -hmm. the fiery arrows and both the 
little blue flowers. It's a terrific intuition, actually. And about how long ago was this, Nancy? Uh, this was 95, 1995. 1995. You, you seem yeah. way better than that today, and that's a quarter of a century ago. <laughs> well, there's more dyings and risings ahead of me, unfortunately. Okay. Or fortunately, I should fortunately, say Fortunately, you should say fortunately. <laughs> I, yeah, should, I, mean, I this should is, indeed. This is re remarkable, yeah. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate your description of this picture, which I probably interrupted. No, so. that's fine. That's fine. So carry uh, on. Okay, so the next image is number 19. And I call this healed. So when I came home, I picked up the colors in that, that I saw on that walk. This was in uh, May, June of 1995. And so mm -hmm. the grounds there in the Bay Area were beautiful with so much greenery and various flowers and so forth. So I picked up those flowers and I had a poster of a Buddhist painting and it was called Peace. I think it was called Peace. And so I really liked the four gates and I liked the idea of that Buddhist painting. So using that as kind of an idea and I had taken a class in what they called watercolor quilts, where you take small pieces of cloth and put them together in an interesting way. And this is what came. And then you can see the movement, the spiral movement of the spirit in an embroidery. I think you can make that out. Yes. Coming out of the center in a gold thread. Mm -hmm. So that I have that on the wall in my hallway. Oh, that that's I beautiful. Go past and, every day. And of course, that's reminiscent of, I mean, the whole story you were just telling is reminiscent of uh, Dr. Jung's image that he did of, of the, what he, he said was, it looked like a very Chinese city. And of course, that was associated with the synchronicity of uh, Richard Wilhelm coming back from. Uh, Qingdao and asking him to write the introduction to the secret of the golden flower yes. and and that was actually the end of his red book there set him on on the way for everything that happened in 1928 so he went on and and wrote for 33 years after that <laughs> yes right he sure did so i'm into i'm still integrating what happened that day <laughs> Hmm. Yes. Yeah. But that but it's interesting that, that by synchronicity it ha this has some relationship to that. I mean it's a yes, it does. It's a quaternity. It's yes. you were you were referring to the four gates of the Oriental City and that sort yes. of thing. And I will for, for the purposes of this video I will pull up a copy of that picture to but alongside of it, okay. Uh, not not alongside, but I'll, I'll right. also show that just for reference for people. Okay, so well, it's been a lovely morning, <laughs> and this would be a good place to break. It has been delightful being with you, Skip. This morning. Well, I feel the same way. And Thank you. I'm delighted. And uh, we'll continue on. I think this is a, a very powerful conversation. I Nancy. do too. I and do too. Running it up, I, I keep take, <laughs> taking on projects and then I have to use myself to tell me what to do next, <laughs> which, which is what got you delayed four months last time, but that's not going to happen. This well, time. I think it was important to have it delayed. I really see that yeah. as a synchronicity because it, it laid a groundwork for what's coming now. So there I was in the dying period. And here I am now in the rising period, mm -hmm. and I think I want I want that to get through to people. You know that this is a natural cycle, and right. there are things we can do that and and notice, and and it can become a there can be beauty through it. Right, and well, and I think 
the conver both conversations, that one and this one, are quite beautiful. But you know, I definitely see you as more lively than you were seeming even back then when you said you were in, in this dying period. And well, I I was in the darkest place of my life when you and I were talking. The reason we were talking is because you had said, I think, in the advanced reading group. If any of you are going through a particularly difficult time, please give me a call. And I did. I took you right up on that. Mm -hmm. And this is what came out of it. But I mean, I was at, uh, I was completely crushed physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually in mm -hmm. that interview. And I think what amazes me as I go back and watch it is that still the spiritual vitality was there. Yes. Even in the midst of that devastation. Yeah, definitely. Very definitely. So now, now, now feeling better. And, I mean, I'm still quite limited, but feeling so much better. Here I am able to bring into the world through you my story. I wanted to just say something to something you said earlier. You said you didn't know how this, how, how this connection really happened. I mean, I think you do know that specifics, but... Uh, here's what it, it's like the junk mail. I'm online. I'm trying to understand a particular concept in Jung. I cannot figure it out. I go online and Google whatever it is I'm looking for. And in the list of those that came up, by the way, yours comes up on the first page on, on most of the searches for Jungian information. That's good to know. And I saw, I saw something about the Carl Jung depth psychology reading group and I thought oh my gosh here I am stuck at home and you know maybe this I could have some kind of community and right. I could learn I could grow in my understanding of young and so I I checked it out and here we are you know so Amazing. it's it's these little unexpected but if we sometimes we don't know it's a synchronicity until later but in yes. looking back just an everyday morning searching on Google, and boom, there is a synchronicity that changes my life in a huge way. I am sort of humbled by it all because I'm not a theologian, and I'm not a psychologist, and one of the things that theologians don't know is that they're psychologists too. They were naturally evolved psychologists. And well, spiritual direction as a religious practice goes way, way, way back and really was psycho a psychological treatment. Right, but it got, so, se it got so separated, though. Yes. When I, men when I mentioned it to Paul Vanderclay, he, he double-took. He, you know, he just couldn't understand that he was in the same business as Jordan Peterson. Wow, that's surprising. And, you know, here's a man who's been a you know, reformed pastor for 30 years, and he doesn't realize that his business and, and psychoanalysis is the same business. Yes. Well, my hope for him would be that he would have a dying and rising from the situation he's in now and come out more in, more in what, what you would call life and light. I try to be very careful because I don't want to cause him big trouble with his no. with his denomination, right? And and so I don't want to I don't want to challenge him. For me, it's no, not, it's not a debate. No, no. And, I think you're quite right. Quite right. And and so I'm hopeful that. that I, I did have one interview with him, and it's been quite popular, as a matter of fact. Uh, not so much, well, even so much on my side, it's got nearly a thousand hits. But on, That's his, great. on his site, the last time I looked, it had over 2,700 hits. So, wow. Yeah. So the, in combination, it's nearly 4,000 people have taken a look at that video. And well, when you shared your religious experiences... Those are numinous, archetypal. They're going to touch every person at the unconscious level. Some will understand it and, and take a piece of it and go searching. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and and some won't but it's a it is a vital living seed that has been planted in the hearts of every single person that sees that video i think i said to you one of the most compelling videos you've ever done and you're, you're, you're talking about the interview with paul yes uh -huh. because because of the sharing of your religious experience mm -hmm. because you're you're bringing the depths uh up into the the light and you're sharing from that center uh from that deep center right and that that and it's the aliveness it's the living word it's not, it's not yeah. the written word it's the living word right 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 that, that's where i have to be careful because <laughs> the logo the logos does the logos has a role here 